Our next speaker is a friend of mine. Um, his name is Mark Schneider. And Mark wears a lot of different hats, mostly husband and father, I'd say, if you have to rank them. Uh, but if you're a watcher of uh, certain debates, you'll notice Mark in the last year or so has developed as one of the voices on the question of what's the future of nuclear power, specifically what's often referred to as Generation 4 nuclear power, uh, the next generation of nuclear power. I'll let Mark talk about it. He has a bachelor's degree in nuclear engineer technology, spent 20 years working with advanced small-scale reactors in the U.S. Navy. It's in the U.S. Naval Nuclear Power Program. He started a business uh, called Generation 4 Nuclear, Inc. You see him on um, social media, at Sub Schneider, S-U-B, at Sub Schneider uh, is where he goes, and he periscopes there. Very valuable, uh, cited quite frequently now, and passed around his perspective on how uh, nuclear power is safe and how the fuel is actually nearly completely renewable. And I think you're going to see, uh, you already are seeing his ideas uh, out into the uh, mainstream and into the debates. Uh, I know that Andrew Yang and Cory Booker, the only two uh, nitwits running, uh, Democrats running for president who have talked openly about nuclear. Everybody else wants to ban it. Uh, but without further ado, I want to introduce you. I'm very honored at Eagle Council. He spoke at, at uh, Collegians, uh, our friend Mark Schneider. Mark? Thank you, Ed, for that, uh, that kind introduction. So uh, I am a military guy. Um, and so in the military, we train like we fight, and we fight like we train. Uh, one of my commands that I did while I was in the Navy, I uh, qualified master training specialist. So I'm going to explain to you why I pick things in the way I do. So the first thing I'm going to say is I have to establish my credibility. Uh, Ed did a great job of giving my background, but I've operated small reactors on submarines all the way up to a large commercial plant for Dominion Energy. Surrey Power Station, right? It's one of the largest plants in the U.S. So I've been doing this since I was 18 years old. I work in nuclear, and like Ed said, I wear many hats as a father, but uh, I love nuclear power so much that my wife is actually a nuclear engineer as well, so I have probably the, the most nerdy pillow talk you'll ever hear. Um, <laughs> all right, so the next step uh, in performing something like this or giving an educational seminar is I'm supposed to do what's called the what's in it for me or the WIFM. And so why do you care about nuclear energy? Well, here's what I'm going to tell you. What if I told you the United States has 10,000 years of energy available to us, and I don't need to mine them for it, I don't need to drill it, it's sitting on empty pads next to nuclear reactors, it's sitting on tanks in the Army, it's sitting in Hanford, Washington, it's sitting out at the lab in Idaho. We have 10,000 years of energy. And now, why is that? It's a simple, actually, answer. It's because the United States uses the most inefficient form of nuclear energy. We actually only harness 0.7% of the available power because we use old generation reactors. So if I were to take a magical wand and go over to Surrey Power Station right now with its two giant reactors that puts out uh, almost 1,900 megawatts to the grid, and I were to wave a wand and magically convert it to a plutonium breeder reactor, the fuel that is loaded in it that normally lasts four and a half years would now last somewhere between four and 500 years. That's how inefficient I'm talking about. Now, when you talk about nuclear energy, there's three, there's three critiques that I always get, and that's Waste, weapons, and meltdowns. So I'm going to talk about them in reverse order. So we'll talk about meltdowns. Now, everyone has heard about Chernobyl. Everyone has heard about Fukushima. Everyone's heard about Three Mile Island. And those are terrible disasters, every single one of them. And the nuclear industry has one goal, and that is a zero-death power. So, and I don't, know if you, I don't know if you know this, but nuclear energy in the United States is 300 times safer than solar, the second most safe power. So meltdowns, right? You have to have certain things for a meltdown. And these new generation reactors, we are actually engineering out meltdown. One of the big things is we use water for our coolant. If you look at every reactor meltdown of the big ones, they all used water as coolant. So we're going to switch the water out for different materials. It makes it safer. 
it's weird and crazy, but water, you know, the, the, the thing of life, is actually bad for nuclear energy. So we could switch the water out. They develop new passive safety systems to make them act and behave safer. I can go into detail with it, but you wouldn't want to hear the techno babble. Anybody who wants to talk to me, I'll be available to talk about it, but they're engineering it out, right? They're using new fuels. They're using all, there's all sorts of new technology they're doing to make them safe from meltdown. All right, the next one is weapons, right? Everyone, I hear about proliferation. That's the big concern. I don't want to use nuclear energy because of proliferation. You actually have to specifically design a reactor to make nuclear weapons material, and people don't understand that. Right? We had special reactors in South Carolina and in Washington State that made our nuclear weapons materials. If you actually put nuclear weapons material into a nuclear reactor and you operate it for at least six months, it's not useful for weapons. The Russians are doing this right now. They have a reactor called the BN-800. It is powered by plutonium from one of their weapons. That plutonium, as of today, can never be used for a bomb. Think about that. I can take weapons and turn it into useless material for bombs, but I can get energy out of it. So the last thing is waste. And that's the big one that everyone talks about is waste. If I took all the nuclear waste in the United States and I put it in a football field, it would only stack 60 feet high. But that waste, we only, we only use about two to three percent of the available fuel in it. I can take that waste, I could put it in a new generation reactor. In that reactor, I could consume that fuel for 20, 30, 40 years. And when I'm done, and what's left over, say I put 100 tons of this fuel in. So I consume all 100 tons of it. I take it out. 60 tons of it is completely non-radioactive. I can just dispose of it using the standard methods that all any, any other industry would use. I have 40 tons remaining. 25 of them are useful for medical and industrial purposes. I can, use, I can make life-saving medicine with this stuff. Anyone here have any family members with cancer? Right? Anyone have radiation treatment? That comes from the nuclear industry. There's a chemical, or there's a, an isotope, or a, an element called technectium. It doesn't exist naturally. It makes a great pipe coating. Only the nuclear industry can create that. That would be in this waste. And then I have 15 tons of waste remaining. Of that 15 tons, the longest it will last is 300 years. The current waste that's actually just fuel lasts between 100 and 200,000 years because it's the fuel. And of those 15 tons, the stuff that lasts for 300 years is probably only one or two tons. We can solve this. It's not difficult, right? This is not, it's not a difficult task. It's as far as how it works. We've proven these technologies. If you watch around the media and, the ind and you talk about, hear people talk about nuclear energy, you hear people talk about thorium and you hear people talk about the molten salt reactor, and they talk about fast breeder reactors. We had all those. In 1961, the United States built a reactor that was safe from meltdown and could eat nuclear waste. In 1961, it was called the, <clears throat> it was called the molten salt reactor experiment. We went away from this energy. That's because of politicians. And there are some changes in the industry that we will have to do. There's a lot of regulations that are in place or not in place that we need. So I want to keep this relatively short because, frankly, my discussions on this is probably going to come better with what your questions are. So if there's any questions, please ask because I want to talk because the dialogue about this is a lot better than me just up here lecturing you. So are there any questions? Yes, sir. Oh, I, so, all right, so that's a great, a, a great comment, Ed. So I, I, when, when I started this and when Ed found me, I had proposed what I call the Green Nuclear Deal in response to the Green New Deal, right? So I look at climate change as a problem 
for one of two reasons. One, maybe it's real, I don't know. But if carbon, is, carbon dioxide is the problem, this would eliminate it. Nuclear is carbon-free energy. Produces less carbon dioxide than wind and solar do, by the way. All right, number two, if climate change isn't real, then we have a bunch of people that are in a mass hysteria that are willing to ruin our economy and ruin our planet with inefficient solar and wind that will literally we have to destroy acres and acres, hundreds of square miles of land for this renewable energy. Right. Are there any new uh, plants in, in, in being constructed now? And number two is, are there any permits being issued or pending? All right, so uh, that's a great question. So worldwide, there are 54 nuclear reactors under construction. The US has two down in South Carolina. There are, I think, 20 sites in the United States that are licensed to build generation three reactors. So these are uh, an upgraded version of the legacy plants, inefficient designs, but they are much safer than the old uh, RBMK, which was the, the Chernobyl model um, and the older design. So they're an upgraded design, much safer than the older stuff. Uh, small risk of meltdown, but there's a lot of mitigating things for that. Um, so that was your first question. What was your, your other question? Uh, new permits. Uh, so yeah, so we have 20. We haven't built, uh, we, we haven't, there's no companies that want to build them yet, but there is something that's super exciting. There's a company called New Scale that's based out of Corvallis, Oregon, and uh, they in 2022 are going to break ground on a, uh, a new design reactor that is safe from meltdown. It utilizes the old style fuel though, and they're going to build it in Idaho, and it's going to be a 12 unit facility. Now, Normally reactors are big and massive, you know, a 900 megawatt reactor, 1,000 megawatt reactor. These are like, the, these 12 reactors are 60 megawatts each, and they're gonna be built in a factory, and each component's gonna be built, and they're gonna assemble it. Now, we know we can do this, because in the United States Navy, that's how we build our submarines. We have two shipyards, they factory build parts of the submarine, each one of them builds half of it, and they ship the other half to each other. That's how we build submarines in the United States right now, and that's how we want to get to nuclear construction is these small, modular designs. Question? So in France, they run most of their electrical grid off of nuclear, and from what I understand, electricity is so expensive there. In fact, I've heard that nuclear, in fact, it was supposed to be too cheap to meter. That's actually one of the more expensive ways to produce electricity. So I guess I'm a little bit of a skeptic that Nuclear sounds great, you know, you're just sticking in a radioactive thing and, and electricity comes out the other end, but in practice, doesn't it turn out to be one of the most expensive ways to generate, to turn your lights on? So actually, um, what's interesting is, is the comparison between France and Germany. So France's 70% of their grid is powered by nuclear energy, and Germany's shutting down their nuclear reactors. France has seen a reduction in their electricity prices, and their electricity is half of what Germany's is. Germany's prices have gone up, and they also produce 45% of their energy is from carbon-based emissions, where France's is five. So does that answer your question? How, how is it going to make it cheap in America? How am I going to cheap it, make, make it cheap in America? That's where the small modular design comes in, because right now it costs about uh, $10 billion for a 1,000 megawatt facility. When you go to a small modular design, it drops that price to about half to, or sorry, one-fifth to one-seventh that cost because you're factory building it. It's like the difference between building a house and building a car, right? We build them in factories so that you can uh, repeat, re repeat your processes over and over. You have the same technicians working on it. That's probably one of the biggest barriers to nuclear in the U.S. is the fact that these large-scale reactors require, they have extremely green workforces that don't know, so there's a lot of rework that goes on. They're all unique design. I can have two sets of reactors that are identical, like say the North End and Surrey, they're, they're sister plants, but they're, many of them are, many of the, the systems inside of them are extremely different because of the large scale makes them super unique. Does that answer your question better? Okay, sounds good. I read a couple of days ago in a Chicago paper that um, Chernobyl, I think, was the one, the site of the accident, nuclear accident, it was referring to that it's surrounded by concrete walls and uh, cooling water, and it'll have to be like this for 300 years or something. This is the type of incident that frightens lay people, you know. Who's going to look after this uh, 
the structure for 300 years? How can we guarantee that it'll be safe? Well, um, so now Chernobyl is you know an, a terrible accident, and we don't ever want that to happen again. To happen again. Um, and I know that there's some unique things that the, the nation of Ukraine is doing uh, to improve and make sure that's safe. They did build a brand new um, sarcophagus over uh, the original sarcophagus that was built in 1986, um, and that is going to contain uh, a, a, the collapse of the original sarcophagus so that it won't spread. Um, so, you know, yeah, 300 years, that's a long time for that stuff. I mean, it's dangerous. But the good thing is, is that we actually can, can clean up radioactive sites. In fact, the United States has a history of that. We've gone to original reactors. The very first Navy reactor was called the S1W reactor. And if she was built out, uh, I, don't rec I don't recall where she was built. There's a lot of reactors. I try to keep them all straight. But that original facility has been completely removed. Any radioactive contamination I think has been taken and shipped to processing facilities. And it is now a safe site. And I think it's completely cleared for residential use now. Well, I have a supplementary question. Okay. Japan was going to release um, uh, wa uh, water that was contaminated by its Fukushima disaster. It was going to release it into the ocean, even though it was, hadn't been cleared of radioactivity. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, in Fukushima, they are going to be releasing water from that plant. Uh, the contamination that they're talking about is tritium. By the way, who here has, who here has drank water today? You have consumed tritium. Right? The levels that they're going to release are not dangerous levels. It's going to be on the scale of eating a banana. Right? So if you, were to, if you lived in, in Japan and you were consuming the water in that harbor, it would be about the amount, uh, you would receive a dose equal to eating a banana. I'm not sure that's completely reassuring, but I think there has to be some way of reassuring the, the pop populations that don't have a great deal of scientific education that uh, accidents, nuclear accidents that happen are uh, not threatening to you know, life or health. So that's one of the things with these new generation reactors is that we're, we're making meltdown, we're engineering meltdown away so you can't have one of these, right? Now one of the things that makes, uh, uh, Fukushima was, was awful because of the, the way that the, the wave washed out their emergency systems. Mm -hmm. So there's a program that the, uh, that the IEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency, created called BDB Flex. It stands for Beyond Design, Beyond Design Basis Flex Program. And so what they have is every single site has, has emergency diesel-driven equipment as a backup to their installed systems. So they can bring that in there. It's on the site in these hardened facilities that could take a telephone pole at 200 miles an hour. And they can bring this equipment in if they were to have uh, a tsunami or something wash out uh, their emergency cooling systems, whatever caused that, to bring cooling back into the reactors. On top of that, every nation, and the U.S. has two of these, has two, na or we have national repositories where within 24 hours, heavy lift helicopters will be landing additional equipment to those sites, bulldozers, electrical generators, uh, diesel-driven pumps to make sure that these reactors are safe. Does that reassure you a little more? Not, not, not 100%. I think you have more work to do. Okay, I appreciate that. I appreciate that feedback. Thank you. But to, to reassure the general public who really uh, don't have a great deal of, uh, of tertiary scientific education, you know, they're, they're going to be frightened by environmentalists and so on because I, the, the threat of cancers and uh, those sorts of uh, life-threatening uh, diseases are, 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 you know, alarming to people. So I, I'll, I'll give you a, a perspective here. Every person in this room receives between 150 and 250 millirem of radiation. I'm getting a little technical here, right? So that's millirem is a me unit of measurement of radiation. I have worked in nuclear reactors for with nuclear reactors for over 20 years, and my lifetime exposure is 255 millirem. <laughs> I'm not worried about cancer. <laughs> Well, that's nice to know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm. There, 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 you, Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I think this is great. Um, I I was in the Navy, so uh, we were on the last of the diesels, the John F. Kennedy, before everything went went nuclear. 
So if it was dangerous, of course, we wouldn't have nuclear ships yeah. when we had thousands. <laughs> um, my thing about how the enemy thinks, um, why would those proponents not want us to delve into nuclear science and to have the things? Because I, I think nuclear in, uh, can, can, can heal certain forms of cancer. Absolutely, yeah. Radiation um, therapy is used, yeah. Right. And, and so what would be the thinking of extremists or enemies to get us to stay away from nuclear technology going into the future because uh, we're hearing about getting, taking away our fossil fuels, taking away electricity, taking away nuclear energy, and all, but all of these things are what we're gonna need if we're gonna live in, 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 in the future. So what is the thinking? Have you all delved into the mindset of, of people who want us to stay away from nuclear technology? That's an interesting question, and I will tell you, one of the things that's fascinating about the renewable industry is that the more wind and solar farms that we build in the United States or anywhere, the, the more dependent we become on natural gas. In fact, if you actually look, the natural gas lobby promotes renewables. They promote renewable energy because it increases their bottom line because they are guaranteed power because of the intermittent nature of the renewables. Wind and solar do not operate when the sun is not shining and the wind stops blowing. In the United Kingdom, nine days the wind went without blowing. They had to run liquid natural gas driven turbines to make up for that the entire time. So our enemy's mindset, or my, in my enemy's mindset, the anti-nuclear mindset, is more of an economic one, is how can I get myself into this? The liquid natural gas lobby has figured out that the renewables are coming because of people like AOC that are promoting things like the Green New Deal, so they're capitalizing on that. Now, I will tell you that my counterparts that are on the left in the nuclear lobby are making arguments because one of the things that we can do with nuclear uh, that we can't with our current plants, our current plants are great for baseload, you can't change the power on them rapidly but the new designs can do a rapid power change, which is what you can do with natural gas. So they're trying to use a similar tactic to natural gas by saying, I can build this stuff cheaper, it's gonna last longer, I only have to fuel it once in its lifetime, it's gonna last 30, 40 years, and on top of it, it will do the load following and work with renewables. And then ultimately, I think what the plan is, is that they will start replacing renewables when we realize, why don't we just run it all the time? My, and my other thing is this. There's technology out here that could shut down all, all of our electricity, you know, through these uh, waves. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, electromagnetic pulses. Right, these electromagnetic pulses. Wouldn't nuclear energy be a deterrent? Because if they try to shut down electricity, couldn't we back it up? some kind of way, I'm just, I'm just Yeah, saying. so that's a, a great question. One of the things that we can do with nuclear energy is the reactors are not big, right? I can take a small reactor and I could put it in every substation in the United States, right? You drive, you, you see them all, all over the place, right? You, all the big breakers and all the equipment. I could put a small reactor right there. I could power this little area of the grid, right? So if an EMP, an electromagnetic pulse were to come and shut down an area, the rest of the grid would be safe. Right? It would only affect that one area, and then once the pulse is gone, I could back flow, I could bring power in from the grid to it. Does that answer the question you're looking for? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. So non-scientific me. We, we do have a problem in this country where people are afraid of nuclear reactors, the ones I see are out in the country. Is there, as you try to get more, as you try to get fourth generation nuclear power, does the distance from the nuclear power plant to the consumer matter? I mean, is there? So other than the, uh, the, the irrational fear that comes with nuclear, uh, no. Um, in fact, actually, uh, one of the things that's fascinating that uh, I live down in southeastern Virginia, and there are more nuclear reactors there than anywhere else on planet Earth because of the United States Navy. 
At one point, the USS Enterprise did a six-month test program with reactors operating pier side, and no one has any idea it's going on because they're a very safe design with great safety protocols. But you're talking about a small reactor in an urban area. I'm saying, yeah. can, can we find a desolate place in Nevada and, and light up Las Vegas and have it so far away that when people try to complain about a nuclear reactor being close to them, that you can say, well, you're, you're going to be nowhere near it. Yeah, we could, yeah. That's, I mean, that's, so the yeah. distance makes no difference. The distance still makes okay. no difference, yeah. Appreciate the question. Uh, I know, sorry, I know quite a bit about the nuclear reactors because I'm familiar with a person who was supervisor of all the nuclear reactors that were built in Illinois. Okay. Uh, and he also worked with Bickover on the Navy submarines and New Bickover and everything. However, uh, even with those big nuclear reactors, the reason why they are so reasonable, which some people don't realize, is because they might cost a lot to build, but they last for so many years that they, the cost is made up. But I'm so glad you have smaller reactors that can be placed at different places uh, and this is very, very important. But no, I'd like to do an article about this. I'm really, uh, uh, I, I belong to the Heartland Institute, and they would be very interested in some of this stuff, and I know the people there. So I would like to do an article, if you have anything about these nuclear reactors, so I could write about this uh, also. But um, no, nuclear energy is very, very safe. And the reason why they went bad, like over in Japan, is because they put the reactors so low that the water came over. And also, when they used the Westinghouse uh, reactors, the tubular stuff, where they were much safer. And these reactors are still good, and they could be renewed, and they could be renewed. The person I know said that you could renew them. These reactors are for at least 100 years, and it would still be good. <laughs> but they just take maintenance and just, you know, putting up do, the date all the time. Do you want to take over for me? <laughs> <laughs> um, so so I, I do have a comment on that, because you did mention about the, new, the reactors in Illinois. So uh, two weeks ago, um, we just put two commercial test fuel assemblies in a reactor in Illinois that uses a new type of fuel. The fuel is, is more dense than the current fuel, and it's safer. It doesn't get to the safe, it can uh, go for higher temperatures. And so if this test is successful, we could potentially replace all the fuel in the current reactors existing in the United States, and we could then upgrade all the reactors. So at the peak of United States power, we had 100, or the peak of nuclear, we had 120 reactors operating. In 2018, we had 98 reactors operating, and they produced more power than any time in the history of the United States. So we have been able to, through new technologies and upgrades of these reactors, make them safer and operate with more power. Are you kicking me out? <laughs> All right, good job. So I appreciate it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be out. We'll, we'll talk more, I'm sure. Real quick one. Okay, we're on a quick one? All right. The Iranians uh, lost their centrifuges with a flash drive. What are we doing in this country to protect ourselves from terrorism like that? Well, um, Here's something that's, it's, it's an interesting question because we actually just had to start building centrifuges again because since the 1980s, we've been down blending weapons from Russia that they sold to us, weapons grade uranium, down blending it to a level that can be used in our reactors. So uh, I don't have the details on that. I, I can see if I can get connection with the guy who does that, but I'm certain there are, there are more facilities for that. Um, or, or things in place for that. But um, with generation four, you won't need centrifuges.